oh, it kind of randomly unlearns frequency 26. Welcome to part three of a walkthrough of progress measures for grokking via mechanistic interpretability. In the first part, we gave a high level overview of the paper. In part two, we did a deep dive into why we are confident that a one layer transformer actually learned this weird ass trig based algorithm, this thing for people who might have had a break between the last video and this one. We are now going to jump into the rest of the paper. And first, Lawrence is going to talk us through why this is not just a single cherry picked model. We are really confident that this is what's actually going on. Yeah, absolutely. One obvious question once you've done an interpretability on one particular model is like, how general is this result, right? Is this just like this particular model that's happened to learn the Fourier multiplication algorithm? Or is it like all small models learn this, this algorithm? And our claim is like all the small models that generalize learn this algorithm. First in C.2, basically what we did for C.2, or I guess what I did is um, you could reproduce all the mainline results. And so for example, if we screw it on a figure 16, uh, we ran four different seeds with the exact same hyperparameters, just like different initializations. And then we could see that, yep, the embedding matrix indeed very sparse for all of them. If we scroll down to figure 17, we could see the same thing for the neuron logic map. Um, what's interesting about these matrices, the embedding matrices, is as with the mainline model, there seem to be more frequencies in the embedding matrix than there are in the neuron logic map. And uh, I'm not sure why exactly that's happening. But it is a consistently true result. Yep. Uh, also, that the same... The same frequencies line up, and I know seed two has got three. It's got three here. Actually, the first model I ever interpreted had three, and then I didn't save the random seed I used, so I had to train a different oh, no. one for this one. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, so basically, seed one uses four, seed two uses three, seed three uses four, seed four uses four. Uh, so interestingly, our mainline model uses the most frequencies, and they're all arbitrary. Yeah, they are arbitrary, as you can see in Figure seventeen. So yep. if you scroll down to, to figure table three, what you could do, repeat the same mainline experiments where we read off the cosine and sine identities. We get exactly the same results. We could see that the fraction of variance explained is consistently very high. And again, like, you know, WL is well approximated by this, like, sum of cosine and sines of the key frequencies. And then in table four, we reproduce the, the results from the mainline network where we ablate, where we do like zero ablation on uh, key frequencies in the logit space. And we could see that Yep, if you like re remove the key frequencies, loss goes really bad, like consistently worse than chance. You know, chance here is like 4.7 or something. And here, like every single loss is greater than 4.7. On the other hand, if you remove every single frequency except for the five, except for like the key frequencies used by the model, loss generally goes down. So, you know, this just saying that the results are the same for other seeds. It's not just this particular model. Just to clarify, all other frequencies removed means... So we're working in kind of the A, B space with our 12,000 dimensions. You're saying you've, re you've got these 10 dimensions for the key frequencies and you remove everything that is not those 10, so the other 12,000? Yeah, uh, though here it's like eight directions for key frequencies, right? Because there are fewer frequencies, but yes. Great. And we're doing this in the A, B space, not the A, B, C space of the full logits. So it's a bit less sketchy. Slightly, slightly less sketchy. Slightly less sketchy. So you've got the full logits, all correct solutions will kind of correlate because the big logits map up align with each other. But if you're like operating in the A, B space, I think it's like significantly more legit. Okay, the reason I know these results are legit is you could do the resampling ablation in, in like <laughs> frequency space and the loss is still lower than test loss. So like, it's like the same as test loss. So, you know, it's legit. This is legit. Yes, where resampling is you just shuffle the stuff that doesn't matter across the data. So if it's contributing annoying noise, Deleting it can't help, like, might help the network. But if you shuffle it, it's going to get weird noise that breaks things. If you haven't successfully, like, reproduced all the directions that matter, right? But here we have actually reproduced most of the directions that matter. Anyways, uh, if we scroll down to C2, so basically we ask the same question. We're like, yep, let's try to train lots and lots of trial transformers on different problems. So we look at one layer transformers, different fractions of the training data. We look at two layer transformers. We look at, you know, smaller, larger, you know, a different prime. We get some fun cursed loss curves. Yeah, slingshots, man. I have no idea. There was this really weird paper called the slingshot effect, slingshot mechanism, which said, turns out when you train grokking models, you get this weird zigzag where it gets good and then it slingshots upwards. This is actually like 
really important to grokking. This happens all the time because our training models are this god awful task where it's just memorizing really, really hard, and it's really weird and fragile and specific in a way that is actually lots of ML is weird, fragile, and specific. But language models are much nicer than this. I don't know. You see lost spikes on language models too, and they just have to roll back the training a bit. The less bad. One cute result I did find is that, at least for the one layer model, part of the slingshots come from Float32. The fact that you're using Float32, because of vagaries about how log softmax is implemented, the smallest that Float32 can output is 1.19 times e to the minus 7. And lots of slingshots, uh, sometimes the slingshots start happening the most when you get past that point. And if you change the Float64 logits, you can get to 10 to the minus 16 and everything's fine. And then we tried two layer models, and they still had slingshots, even with Float64, and we gave up. Yeah, exactly. Do we have this cute slingshot graph? What's the cute slingshot graph? Oh, I had this graph where you've got the loss curve for Float32 and the loss curve for Float64. I see. We removed and... that because originally it was there because we are like, ah, oh, we know what's going on, let's put it in. And then we looked at the two-layer model and we are like, we don't know what's going on, let's take it out. I maintain that it's part of the story. It has to be part of the story. We could speculate all the day, but my, my current speculation it has to do with how Adam divides by a very small number. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Yes, here is the training curve for the mainline model if you use Float32. Here is the loss curve you get if you use Float64. And these are very, very different things. This only happens in Adam or Adagrad, where other things are where you divide by the square size of the gradient. So I'm pretty sure it has something to do with that. But like. You know, we weren't able to track it down in time. Yes. Uh, we decided to reprioritize. Also, because I was kind of bored of Grok. <laughs> so we reran the experiments, uh, mainline experiments. If we look at, go down to table five, which is quite a bit farther down, actually. Glorious, glorious table. Yes. 27 additional transformers on top of the five that we looked at before. All of them use the algorithm. Uh, some of them are more messed up than others. The 40%, you know, the various training fraction ones, these are very, very clean, very nice. The two-layer transformer, quite nice. A uh, little less nice, but like still quite nice. The smaller prime, the same prime, these are very nice. The dropout models, oh man, the poor, poor <laughs> dropout models. Um, it just really sucks to be a dropout neural network, right? Like 20% <laughs> of your brain shuts off randomly sometimes, or 50% of your brain shuts off randomly sometimes. Just a recap for yeah. people who aren't super familiar with ML. Dropout is this horrifying technique that used to be pretty popular, but is going a bit out of fashion nowadays, where uh, you just want to make your model more robust. So every time you run it, you randomly choose like 20% of the neurons and like zero ablate them, just set them to zero. And do a random different 20% every time. And this seems to make models overfit less because you're just like savagely attacking their brain in a different way each time. And apparently generalizing things, uh, like it's easier for them to have redundancy than fragile memorizing things or something. That seems right. Yeah. And it's more spread out. Uh, the computation is more spread out for the generalizing algorithm in our case. And here you did drop out on the neurons in the MLP layer. Am I correct? Only the MLP neuron. Cool. Yeah. Yes. People normally do even weirder crap with drop out in language models. I don't know why. There was some work way back in the good days of 2018, 2019, uh, when, where they, they argue that dropout is morally similar in some sense to uh, weight decay. And what? empirically, it seems to be about the same. Yeah. What? Uh, we're not going to get into it. Machine learning math is okay. always very messed up. But the point <laughs> is, empirically, it seems to do about the same as weight decay. So people just use weight decay. And that's, you know, and it's much cleaner. You don't get all this random noise. You don't get like, if you look at um, figure 28, um, which is really horrifying. It's, it's scroll down. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the poor, poor dropout models are, uh, <laughs> their loss is just going up and down randomly because sometimes half their brain shuts off and then you're like, ah, oh, crap, you know, why? And then it like updates wrong because, you know, half its brain is shut off when it's, you do the update and then it like over updates in that direction. And you like, it tries to like update backwards because a different half of its brain got shut off. It's just very <laughs> sad, very noisy. So, you know, in practice, you just do weight decay so much smoother, so much nicer, right? If you look at the loss curves earlier in the paper, like even just like one page before, they're like so nice, so smooth, so clean. Mm. And this is probably why people don't do dropout as much anymore. Yeah, the things on the right are L1 weight penalties. So weight decay is you penalize it for the average sum of squared weights. 
L1 is you may penalize it for the average of like absolute values with weights, and yeah, it just doesn't seem to grok, which is mildly surprising. Not really, right? Because um, so the weight decay term encourages you to spread out your computation because you want your weight norm to be small, or your like L2 norm to be small. But here, if you want your L1 norm to be small, or reality, what actually happens, you just like, I think what happens here is I didn't decouple the L1, uh, the L1 penalty from the Adam update. So I did not implement Adam's sign. I implemented like the normal L1 penalty. And I think Adam just like erases the L1 term for whatever reason. Okay, two in the weeds. Uh, though one thing worth saying is that, in my opinion, the model is kind of morally in the wrong basis a lot of the time, because the inputs are these one hot encoded things that are like zero, one, two, as the different dimensions, when really it wants to have like cos 14x as the important dimension, or like cos 42, and L1 is like what we call privileging the basis of the actual weights because it encourages the model to have most of them be zero and some be non-zero, and maybe L1 weight decay in the correct basis would be more sensible, who knows. It's very possible, uh, though I've, I've only experimented with L1, two different kinds of L1 on, you know, the normal basis, and neither of them did the thing we wanted to. This is fair. But anyway, you prioritize, and you did 32 models, and life is good. So we're pretty sure that our reverse engineering generalizes. Now we're going to return to, like, you know, the actual point of the paper, which is, so grokking, what? Why does it grok? What is going on? The main tool we're using here, is these progress measures. Test loss is this kind of pretty sharp, janky thing that goes from bad to good pretty rapidly. Fundamentally, the model's got these two solutions, generalizing and memorizing. We know what the circuits for generalizing look like, so we should be able to like disentangle these two. And the goal of a progress measure is to come up with some like automated metric that can leverage our understanding to disentangle. Or rather, progress measures are things that are trying to disentangle what's going on inside the model and ideally track progress that isn't fully captured by accuracy or loss. We're specifically taking the angle that you should do this with mechanistic interpretability. This is a promising, exciting new way to make progress measures. And we've got these four metrics. So uh, in my opinion, the top two are the most interesting. The top left is excluded loss. One of the striking things about the generalizing solution is that it's sparse in that it only uses a few directions. And it's also predictably sparse in that we know which directions it will use. And in particular, in the mainline model, once we know the key frequencies the model uses, we can, I believe we take the logits, we've got the logits of this A by B by C thing, and then we can combine the logits, and then we can look at the A and B part of the logits and say there are these cos W A plus B and sin W A plus B directions. These are the only thing that the generalizing solution cares about. We know that if we ablate them, it destroys everything. If we ablate everything else, it doesn't really matter. But when the model's memorizing, there's no reason it should be using these 10 directions. So by either ablating these 10 directions or ablating everything not in the 10 directions, we should be able to disentangle the two things. And excluded loss, we ablate the 10 directions and measure train performance. The goal of this is to isolate out how much of the train performance comes from the memorizing solution. Restricted loss, we ablate everything but these to kind of delete the memorizing solution and check how good the model's performance on the unseen test data is. If we clean up the memorizing solution for it. Our argument is that grokking actually breaks down into these three separate phases of training. There's memorization, where it just says, okay, memorizing is just easy. I'm just going to memorize first. And as we discussed in part one, there's presumably some feature of the problem space the model is learning such that it prefers to learn, it prefers to memorize things than generalize. Like it's easy to get there fast. But then eventually the model equilibrates and it plateaus. And it's kind of worth noting why this happens. If you train a model without weight decay, it never plateaus. It just keeps getting better and better, albeit slower and slower. Because once you've got perfect accuracy, you can always become more and more confident in your answers. And cross-entropy loss keeps going down and down. 
Namely, you might think, why does the model even care beyond 10 to the minus 7? It's kind of trivial. But weirdnesses of atom mean that the model actually does still care because things kind of get normalized. You'd expect the gradients to be tiny when the loss is tiny, but because atom, if you double the gradients, you double the numerator and denominator, it doesn't really matter. So gradients being tiny doesn't make a difference. It's about the direction. But weight decay says, okay, you can't be too complicated. So it eventually levels off. But the model wants to be simpler because we're using weight decay. And so there's this period of circuit formation where it realizes the best way to become better performing while also having lower weights is to slowly learn the generalizing solution. And it does some weird internal voodoo to transition from the memorizing solution to the generalizing solution, which we can see where the excluded loss, that is the pure memorizing performance, goes from pretty good to worse than random, even as the train performance is plateauing to slightly increasing. And to emphasize the slightly improving part of train loss, it's not really that the generalizing solution is better or the memorizing solution is worse. It's that the fixed weight norm, they are better. And the, the model might actually prefer to have a worse loss, but better for like smaller weights or vice versa. And it's kind of the trade-off on the frontier of these two things that matters to it. And throughout this, it's kind of balancing between the two. But the more it's generalizing, because the generalizing solution is a bit simpler, the better the equilibrium point is. And if we look at the sum of squared weights, we see that, yes, this clearly matters. And that despite train performance being the same, total weights is like changing a lot. And this is kind of a dominant factor in what the model's doing. And then finally, okay, so why is test loss still terrible? So it turns out the test loss is still improving, though you can't really see it on our log scale. Uh, but it's like very slow and it's so much worse than random. And the reason for this is that memorization is like much, much worse than random on the things you haven't seen yet. Because getting random performance is like actually non trivial. You need to output the same number for everything. And this requires some effort. And the model just doesn't bother. Like, you always want to be outputting a big, really big number and lots of really small numbers. And if the big number is wrong, you're performing terribly. So the test loss is pretty bad, even when the model is mostly generalizing. And we see this with restricted loss, because when we remove the memorizing solution, it's just getting better. Like quite consistently, in fact. Yes. So I will note that I deliberately trained the model with full batch training, meaning Rather than giving it a random subset of the data each time, I just gave it all of the data because there's only 12,000 data points, so I just can. Then there's this final phase of cleanup where the model says, okay, I'm so good at generalizing. I don't even need to bother. I can just get rid of the memorizing because it's now more effort than it's worth. And that's this final phase when test loss actually crashes. And fundamentally, to grok, you need to not only be generalizing, you need to also not be memorizing. I would also add, uh, if you go to figure 26 or figure 28, so like over here in the figure in the main body, we can see that between like, you know, 1,000 and 10,000 epics, there's this like approximate plateau where like train loss stays about the same. While like, you know, at figure 26, one thing you'll notice is that there's never this plateau. It is just smoothly decreasing over time because, you know, in figure 26, this is a model that doesn't have weight decay, has no incentive whatsoever to like try to clean up its act. It just like keeps increasing its logic scale over time sort of a confirmation of what Neil was saying earlier. <laughs> yes. And another thing worth noting is that the amount of weight decay doesn't really matter because the reason it grocks is that we've chosen an amount of data such that memorization is a bit more complicated than generalization. And so the model will just always prefer to generalize for the same fixed weight. And in fact, if you change the weight decay coefficient, it changes the speed of grokking, but not the fact that it grocks. So it does seem to make things like a bit messier, or at least there's one seed that's messy for some reason. There's one seed out of five that's messy or something like that, and it's messing up the graph. I hope you appreciate the fact that we did not cherry pick the data and just remove the annoying seed. So I found that if you do weight decay 0 0.01, it drops after 300,000 epochs after I left it running overnight. <laughs> and yeah, it's also worth saying there's not some inherent property of memorization that makes it more complex. The key distinction is that memorization complexity scales with the number of data points memorized. Generalization complexity does not. 
Grokking is fundamentally cherry-picked in the sense that I chose the amount of data which looked most dramatic. Yeah, we've got this figure with different fractions of data, and we see uh, notes that the bottom six have what zero to 5,000 epochs, the tops have zero to 20,000, and we see that 0.3 looks way more dramatic. Actually, 0.28 looks even more dramatic than 0.3. I think 0.25 was the best. Why didn't they make it in? Best number. We're doing grid search, right? We want to be consistent. Uh, if you look at figure 21, for example, you can see this like very clear pattern, right? We just look at like, you know, how long does it take to achieve very low lo train and test loss? You can see like there's a massive gap for like 0 0.3 and there's like 0 0.4 has a small gap. And then after like, you know, 0 0.5 has another small gap and then 0 0.6 onwards, there's basically no gap. And I don't know, if you start with these graphs, there is still some weirdness like this tiny phase change at the start, which... I think either might be some property of the problem or just something weird about, I don't know, I'm using a learning rate schedule with like a warp for the first 10 steps. Maybe that makes things weirder. I think that's it. I think that's probably it. Other features that make the learning dynamics weirder, the model kind of first learns to get perfect accuracy. And then when it has perfect accuracy, the best way to improve is just like make all of your weights bigger and get rid of everything you're not using, which is like a very different learning trajectory that's a lot more linear. And I can imagine that looks different. There's also this kink that I think comes from the atom beta, as we discussed earlier on one of our random tangents. You can actually like see the kink when you like look at this accuracy plot, right? So mm -hmm. like you can see that like when it's like the loss is like about flat, mm -hmm. the accuracy is going up really, really fast. And like once it heat hits one accuracy, at that point, that's when like the log loss starts, you know, right here. Yep. So like on the yes. left, right? You see it immediately gets the mm -hmm. one accuracy. And then there's a kink at which like log loss starts declining differently. Um, and that's the kink is when it reaches perfect accuracy. Let me just get a figure with a log scale x-axis. So it'll be much clearer. Yeah. So if you look at like here around uh, Epic 200, right? This is when it reaches 100% accuracy. And 200 is also when you see this kink. Okay. So the slope here looks kind of weird because we took the log of the x-axis, but like the slope like decreases significantly at around 200, like the slope of the decline and loss. Uh, interesting. Yes. Note that we've only got data points every uh, 100 for accuracy and every 10 for loss. I don't know why. This is not a straight line. This is just two points, which are linearly interpolated. Oh, yes. I mean, we can uh, we can fix that later. We might fix that at some point. It doesn't show up with, unless you log the x-axis anyways. So Yes. There's one more progress measure, right? So the Gini coefficient is a measure of sparsity. And then it like tells you basically, if you like do a Fourier transform, the embed matrix or the neuron logic map, this becomes significantly sparse over time. And there's this like change in the slope of how fast it gets sparse at around 10,000 time steps, which is when cleanup is happening. So as it gets cleaned up, it's become suddenly becomes significantly more sparse. And I think Neil has a very cute, like interactive diagram that shows this visually. So yeah, one of the great things about uh, having actually reverse engineered this is we can just stare at the embedding matrix throughout training. So the bar over here is where we are in training. This is the embedding matrix in the trig basis. And at the end of training, we see that it's like beautiful and sparse. We see that even post plateau, it's kind of slowly decreasing things. But that even like here, in the middle of circuit formation, but when train lo test loss is like at 70, which is horrifically bad, it's clearly becoming spots. And it's like very smoothly and continuously making progress. And then around like 10,000, it, it becomes significantly sparser. There's like a sudden period where like, and like it massively increases in sparsity. So like right around now, you can see like, wow, it suddenly starts decreasing really fast. Yes. Yeah. And it's worth emphasizing that for all our talk about hidden progress measures, uh, like kind of continuous progress, like that's clearly a kind of sharpness here. Like goes from kind of like smooth progress to like very sharp progress, kind of around the time cleanup is happening. Yeah, it's continuous. Continuous does not mean like, you know, has a small Lipschitz constant or anything. We go from things looking like a sharp corner to things looking like a more rounded corner, not things looking like a straight line. There's also just like a couple of other really fun things to stare at in here. So like if we just look at what's happening around the time it's becoming really sparse, we see, okay, there's some big bars, but they're kind of many big bars. There's 35, there's 14, there's 25. Sorry, the hovers are incorrect. They're off by one. Um, but then as it continues going, you get this weird bump. And it seems like this weird bump is associated with deleting 25. 
and boosting 30, 31, that like weird frequency, but we don't know why it matters, but where it seems to still be around at the end. And like, why does this happen? I have no idea. Why does 43 go down? I have no idea. It's just a thing. I think this is like a cool area of future work. Just, just, just what? Can you dig into what's happening here? I'm particularly interested in this because from a what is going on in models perspective, this idea of competition between equally valid circuits was like a pretty interesting question. There's, I mean, there's a trivial case, but you could just learn like a circuit with neurons 5 to 10 or neurons 11 to 15, and these are equally good. But also, I don't know, the reason I'm trying to interpret models is I ultimately care about aligning sophisticated human level and beyond models. And when you get different circuits, like do the thing your operators want or give your operators what they want to hear while plotting your escape. These are kind of equivalently good in a bunch of ways. How do models choose between them? They have same behavior on trading. Exactly. These kind of behave the same. How does competition between them work? This is just like an extremely toy mystery that I don't understand and I'd love to understand. Please, please feel free to do it yourself and or reach out to us or something. Yes, again, I have the sequence 200 concrete open problems in Mechantup, and this includes a bunch of weird things about training dynamics that I want people to go and investigate. There's also a CoLab notebook accompanying this paper and a how to reverse engineer modular addition tutorial. And a final progress measure that uh, apparently my co-authors think is less cool than I do. Okay, so first of all, all the progress measures also reproduce on all the other models, because it wasn't obvious. Yes. Things work. Things in this paper actually <laughs> work. <laughs> we checked really hard. Yes, we have tried hard to make sure we are not lying to you, because that would be really embarrassing. Ben's whole weekend just like staring at 32 models or 31 additional models. So, you know, it, I'm not lying to you. I'm pretty sure it works. Yeah. We all appreciate Lawrence's sleepless nights training many, many models. Okay. So my personal favorite progress measure is this idea of a uh, logit similarity or logit periodicity, which features much more centrally in a sequel paper to this, looking at general groups. So the idea of this is, okay, one of the bolder claims of our algorithm is this argument that the logits should be cos w a plus b minus c. It's just like a direction. It's kind of wild that the logits might do this, because even though the logits have good performance on the training data, this does not force them to be in any kind of linear subspace. But we can look at what fraction of the logits are represented by these numbers. And further, we can easily do this for each frequency. And we can track this during training. And we both see, yep, things are smoothly growing. Uh, we can also do excluded and restricted loss per frequency. I don't know if you've got these graphs in here. But the thing which I find really wild about this is that the different frequencies are not growing at the same rate. They do not perfectly correlate. You've got 14, which starts early on and then actually kind of gets suppressed during cleanup. Well, I mean, all of them get suppressed during cleanup. During yeah, cleanup. sorry. I would say that 14 gets yeah. suppressed earlier. Keeps rising. Some of the bumps in the loss curve kind of correspond to one or two of these frequencies doing weirdness. Uh, 41 goes up throughout like almost all of cleanup. And just the fact that they swap order. And one hint about what's going on is that if you dig into them, 14 is a very neuron heavy thing. There isn't an attention head which is multiplying by 14. It's entirely done by neurons. 35 and 52 have attention heads, right? So if you look at the OV circuit, this is the one for 35. And then there's one for 52 below. Yeah, and then here are the two heads that just amplify the, the embeddings. Mm -hmm. And then if we go back to this graph, we've got 35, which only comes into being way later. 52, which actually comes into being earlier. 41, which is even later, which is neuron-based. And maybe this isn't the most cohesive story, but the fact that different things are implemented in different bits of the model, and these happen at different rates, I think is pretty interesting. And again, interesting area of future work. I don't know what's going on. The great thing about this work is you could take your collab notebook and you can train a model in like half an hour. So, you know, you don't actually need any resources whatsoever to do this sort of work. Everyone can do it. My model is trained in like five minutes. Oh man, even better. <laughs> Not even half an hour. Not when I was training a model with weight decay 0 0.01 and waiting for it for 350,000 epochs. I want to dig into an area close to my heart, which is uh, the fact that you can get grokking in a bunch of different contexts. So tragically, there was since this paper called Omnigrok, 
which is this in more interesting contexts and better. So my hypothesis about grokking is that grokking is inherent to phase transitions. This property of a problem, such as no matter how much data it gets, the model is initially bad, then rapidly becomes good, rather than smoothly becoming better, which is a thing we've observed in real models, most notably induction heads, and this paper, In Context Learning and Induction Heads, that I was involved in. I found that if you take models which have these phase transitions, and you give them a restricted amount of data, then they will grok. If you fiddle with your hyperparameters right and do a bunch of other screwing around. And I managed to get induction heads to grok, which are this circuit which it at inference time searches the previous text the model's been given, looks for repeated subsequences, and if it's in the middle of a copy of that, predicts it's going to continue. I also did this really dumb skip trigram task where the skip trigrams are just a lookup table that say if you got the token B. If the token A appeared anywhere in the context, predict C comes next. If you give infinite data, it learns this in a phase transition. If you give it limited data and massage your access right, it's kind of grokky, though very weird. These are interesting because the problem we had, there's just 12,000 possible data points. It sees a third of all data and memorizes that. Here, there's like 100 to the power of 100 possible sequences to give the model. And the same thing works on much longer sequences with larger vocabularies. And it grocks on like 500 out of 100 to the power of 100, uh, which is a minuscule fraction. It's tiny. Yes, the final task is five digit addition, where I was like, okay, let's just give a model five digit addition. Each digit is a separate token, it's got a plus sign and an equal sign. And I just give it the sequence like one, two, three, four, five plus two, four, five, six is like, I don't know. 0, 8, blah, 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 and train it to predict the next token on the final six digits. And it turns out if you do this, the model grocks. But further, it turns out that the model, so this is training the model with infinite data, and it's kind of phase transition. And then if you train it with 700 data points, it grocks, again, with a slightly cheating axis. And clear train test divergence. It's also worth clarifying that when I say phase transition, I mean a different thing than when I mean grokking. When I see a curve like this, I think that it's a phase transition not grokking, because there's not a divergence between the train performance and the test performance. That in fact is not a train performance because I'm training out infinite data, so it never sees a data point twice. And I try to reserve the word grokking for there is a sharp shift in the ability to generalize, and there is a divergence between train and test performance that later converges, which is much stricter. And the really wild thing about five-digit addition is that if you look at the loss per digit, so like there's six output digits, you can score it per digit, there's like a different phase change per digit. I believe the dotted lines are kind of when the different phase changes happen. Is that correct? Seems right. It's when they like start learning each token. Yeah. And kind of here, the zero of the digits, the kind of zero or one leading digit is easiest. Oh yeah, note that by zero, I mean the first thing, not the units thing. Easiest to get to grokked first. Then the order in which things are grokked is kind of weird, and it's not what I would have predicted, where token five is like the easiest, it's the units digit, it's just addition mod 10. And it's actually grokked last. So I don't know what's up with that. This kind of bumpy but kind of sharp-ish loss curve decomposes into a lot of like very sharp loss curves. And in fact, if you train on different seeds, the order in which like the phase transitions happen just varies in a way that seems like semi-arbitrary. Or rather, it seems like the model is kind of working its way from forwards inwards, and like it like picks a random digit to get good at. And then it gets good at the next digit and the next digit, or like the other way. And I don't know what's up with this. I think that just reverse engineering this model and trying to figure out what on earth is going on would be another great area of follow-up work. If you look at it in the Fourier basis, it's still sparse. Like the frequency three just does not occur, which suggests it's using some variant of my algorithm to do addition mod 10 with some fudging for the fact that you sometimes need to count. In fact, if you like look at GPT-2 small and you look at the circuits that do addition there, uh, many of the MLPs also exhibit this property where they're very sparse in the Fourier basis. GPT-2 small can do addition? Really shitty addition. Yeah. What? Like, it could count up by two or three at a time, right? So it can count up. And that's, like, kind of shitty addition. 
Sorry, I was not aware of this. What? Can I read this anywhere? This is from Adria at Redwood. I don't know if his work is public. It sounds yeah. great. He was like, I can't interpret this thing. Why is it like nothing I do is interpretable? And I'm like, have you tried doing the Fourier transform? And he did it. And then there's like spikes at, at certain frequencies. I'm like, okay, well, you know. Oh my God, that is incredible. Yeah. One uh, project that is on my to-do list is GPT-J can do surprisingly okay two to addition got like 20% accuracy or something, which is probably a lot better than it can reasonably have memorized. And I just want to go check. Generally, you get like two digit numbers, which form as tokens. Is, is there like this algorithm mod 100 happening? I have no idea. So that basically summarizes what I think are the important things in the paper. Now, maybe let's just dwell a bit on kind of final takeaways, future directions, and what a listener should do if they're listening to this and they're like, oh my God, this sounds so exciting. As I'm sure maybe one or two of you out there who managed to get to the end of this are because of the glories of selection bias. Given that you got to the end, you're probably excited, right? I mean, how could you not be excited? There's a phase change per digit. What the fuck? Yeah. I don't know. In terms of further directions to me, the thing I'm most interested in is just what is up with phase transitions. Because they seem like the thing that actually generalizes to real models. Since, like, GPT-3 is not grow. It is not being trained on repeated data, but it does seem to learn induction heads with a phase transition. I haven't checked GPT-3, but every other model we check does this. Two things I'm super interested in is looking into these kind of toy examples that show phase transitions and just checking, like, what's going on? Like, can we reverse engineer why there's a per-digit phase change? Is it something stupid, like the positional embeddings per digit just, like, get learned slowly? So the attention heads only get the right information at a certain point? Or is it something deeper? I'm like at least 30% that it's just the stupid positional embeddings thing. I haven't checked very hard. But if you could show that, that would make me sad, but in a fun way. So you could do the same thing we did, where we like take the Fourier transform of the embeds. But this is for like the numbers 0 to 320, which are like all the contiguous numbers in gpd 2 smalls tokenizer that are like, you know, a single uh -huh. token. And you can look at... This is the Fourier transform of it. Um, and what? you can see that, like, it has spikes. Yeah, it has spikes. Mod 320? No, no, no it doesn't look like mod 320. It's just that uh, the tokens zero to, like, 300-something. I forgot the exact number. There is our contiguous. There's, like, one token for each of these numbers. And then afterwards, like, you know, they start getting represented by many tokens beyond that level. It's just this is the, the number of, like, tokens that are, you know, discreetly represented. Of, like, one to three-digit numbers that are represented by a single token. Anyways, the point is, you do see this. You do see similar spikes, right? It does seem like it's not as clean as in our original paper, but you do see these like massive spikes at particular frequencies, which does suggest that something like this is going on inside of GPT two small. Huh. And so, sorry, what's the x yeah. and y axis and the color and the different lines here? Uh, sorry, so the y axis is the is the norm of the Fourier component. So this is mm -hmm. like very similar to some of the figures in our paper, and the x axis yeah. is uh, the cosine. It's the cosine of W. This is the key frequency. So it's cosine of 60. Cosine of like gotcha. 60 times 2 pi over, yeah, over okay. 320. And so the key yeah. thing is we're choosing some angle W. Is W like 2 pi over n times an integer here as well? Yeah, so it's 2 pi over 320 times an integer. Yeah, where like the integer is the number that's plotted on the x-axis. Yep. And what are the what are the different faint lines in the background? Uh, so the, the fucky thing about you know, doing things with GPT-2 small is you can't take the entire data set and feed them in, right? And the reason this is different is, uh, is you can feed in the tokens at different positions. Anyways, it's just it's just like, once, once you're out of the toy domain where you can take your entire data set and feed it in cleanly, mm -hmm. and you're in this new domain where you like, you know, have to like feed in the tokens at each of the positions or something like that, and then look at the sum of the position plus like mm -hmm. token embedding, you get a lot of noise in the background. I think each of these lines in the background is one particular, I don't forgot if it's one particular sequence position or one particular or one particular data point or something. But my point is like, it does seem like these spikes, these like the sparseness in the Fourier space seems to transfer even for real models. Wild. Gigantic ass digression. That was great. I want to dig in one of this. And like the fact, these lines seem very evenly spaced. This is like 60, this is 75, this is 90, this is 120, this is 150. This is making me wonder with like, so, the fact that you're doing 2 pi over 320 times an integer seems kind of broken to me. It seems like there's no reason it's going to be mod 320. I feel like you should just do like a kind of grid search of many angles 
or just not grid search, just like randomly do a bunch of angles. And like the fact that you're seeing this kind of evenly spaced behavior makes me think it's actually something like uh, 2 pi over 10, which would make sense because base 10 is possibly the right way things happen or like 2 pi over 100 is my guess looking at this. I don't know, I just like try, try like a bunch of things around this angle. Someone should figure this out. If you're excited to work on this, Adria is looking for collaborators. So, you know, maybe reach out to him. Yeah, this is Adria Garriga Alonso. Adria Garriga Alonso, yep. You people can probably Google and find. Other future directions. I would also love someone to try to re properly reverse engineer the toy induction heads model I had and try to look at how the phase transition happens. Can you predict it? Is there some kind of lottery ticket style thing going on? One cool experiment would be to seed in the previous token head at the start and see if that makes induction heads happen much faster, or seed in an induction head and see if the previous token head happens much faster, or take the thing that's eventually an induction head, take the initialization, substitute that into another model and see if that also forms the induction head, and like stuff like that. Classic. Yep. It's just, yeah. What's going on? Uh, any future directions you want to call out, Lawrence? I love doing toy model stuff. Like, I really did enjoy working on this project. I also like uh, the follow-on project with group operations just because it's so easy. Everything is so clean. We know all the features and everything trains in, like, you know, a few an hour at most. But, like, I, I'm personally more excited about approaches that scale to larger models. So, for example, like, I'm interested in, like, more systematic approaches to evaluating interpretability hypotheses. Uh, one of which is, I don't know, Redwood Research's favorite new one, or, you know, maybe their favorite new one. It's unclear. Uh, which is called causal scrubbing. So like we talked a bit earlier about like what, whether or not you should do like zero ablations, mean ablations, or this like resampling ablation. Uh, basically causal scrubbing is just like a uh, taking the resampling ablation idea and then finding a way to like generalize it to like work on many, many large classes of hypotheses as opposed to just like, you know, only removing parts of the model. Alignment forum, it's on the alignment forum. There may or may not be an archive paper that's submitted at some point, but we'll have to see what happens in the next month or two. I have this list in my concrete different problem sequence of just things that I want someone to go do. I'm also just really excited about if someone could find a way to extrapolate the progress measures to predict when grokking will happen. There's also this great post by Adam German and Buck Schleicheris trying to dig into why you get these kind of phase transition and S-curves in a toy analytic model. And just trying to get, yeah, things that engage with real models as well. Just like see if you can get any evidence of any of these claims we've been making, in particular around phase transitions and how much anything you find in a toy model transfers. This is one of the things you could do. So this is a the plot reproduced, classic plot that would be produced from one of the anthropic induction head papers, but for our modular addition network. Um, if you just like look at the principle of components of logits over time, it seems like around. Oh man, the, the axis is really wrong. Uh, what we're doing is we're taking the logits, we're flattening it into this A by B by C single dimensional vector, so 113 to the power of three. And then the other axis is like the checkpoints where we take a model, we take the logits on the model at each, after each like 100 steps of training. And then we look at the most important directions in like, I think, logit space over time. And we look at the coefficients of these. And they seem to kind of roughly track a memorizing direction and a generalizing direction. In particular, like at first the model starts at like zero, zero, and then it goes to like at around 1400, it has this curve. And that's exactly when the model is like, you know, reaches its kink in the train loss. And then again, at around like around 10,000 steps, when it starts like doing cleanup, it seems to have this like additional kink over here. So it seems like, it sure seems like there's something related to, you know, how the model is. It seems like this gives us some hint about what the model is doing, though we weren't able to really extrapolate this into any like yes. you know predictive results. Oh, specifically, I got somewhere with doing a linear extrapolation on the first two principal components to see when it would mm -hmm. cross like I think like uniform loss on the train data or on the test data or something. But this only worked when you restricted to the first few principal components, and it only worked when you calculated these components over all of the data rather than just like up to that point. So it's still cheating, but it's cheating a bit less. So it's true. Definitely cheating a bit less. Yeah, people are more generally interested in getting into Mech and Tup and doing something useful. I think it's a surprisingly approachable area to just start screwing around on your own. 
Um, I have this post called Concrete Steps to Get Started in Mechanistic Interruptibility that tries to be my guide to like what exactly you should do to get spun up fast, which you can find at neilnander.io slash getting started. Classic. Um, I recently discovered how to convert my website into URL redirects, and this brings me so much joy. So I've started using it everywhere. You can also find my concrete open problems sequence at uh, neilanda.io slash concrete dash problems, sorry, concrete dash open dash problems. I hope anyone who's had to the end of three hours enjoyed what they signed up for. And thanks for joining me. And thanks for all the help making the paper a reality. Yeah. And uh, feel free to reach out with questions. Is there anywhere yeah. people can find you online if you want to be found? Uh, you can search my name. I think that actually that actually should work. <laughs> let, me, let me try yeah. this. Lawrence Chan. That's your LinkedIn. That is me on LinkedIn. ChanLawrence.me. There we go. There we go. Yeah, I do show up. I'm very happy. Okay, search Lawrence Chan at Berkeley. Go check out ChanLawrence.me. This was delightful. I hope people enjoyed this. And yeah. Go check out the paper or my how to do modular addition from scratch tutorial. See you around.